Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Now, tonight is healing and communion service. And so we are going to be teaching on healing. So uh, let's pray and get started with our, with our teaching. Praise God. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have this evening to come and to receive from your word. We thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit, who is, in fact, the teacher of the church, will speak through me and that, Father, he will guide and direct this service and that this information this, uh, that we will see tonight, the, the word of God that we'll see tonight, will mean something not only to us but to those that we speak to and share with concerning your word. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. And while you're getting there, let me tell you a little bit about this message. This is an unusual message. Pastor asked me to speak. And so as usual, I began to meditate on the word, meditate on what to uh, teach on. And last night, I went to bed. And sometime in the middle of the night, I kind of had a dream, if you will, or a half dream, awake, uh, where I was teaching. And I was teaching on the subject of hope. And then pastor said something this morning about it. it was healing convenience service. And I went, well, how's that going to fit in? And then on the way to church, as I was praying in the Holy Ghost, just minding my own business, all going to church, uh, the Lord said, here's how it fits together. <laughs> and so I got it. We're going to teach on uh, hope for healing. Praise the Lord. That's our title. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We know, first of all, that, that all healing is a result of faith, okay? You don't get healed in your body without faith, either on the part of the person doing the ministering, if, it's in a, if it is a supernatural gift of healing, which, you know, kind of God does as he wills, gifts of the Spirit, uh, or on your part to receive just on your own faith. Now, I will say this. When a minister ministers to you the Word and he's operating in faith, and uh, ministers healing to you, you still have to have faith to receive. I'm not excluding that. I'm just saying, trying to say there's a difference between receiving it just on your own, at home in your own time, <laughs> and being in a meeting where the gifts of the Spirit are in operation. That's all I'm trying to say there. All right. So let's get into Hebrews 11.1. 1. Very familiar scripture, definition of faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, or by means of faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which we now see here, right around us, are made, were not made, of things which do appear. They were made of something that doesn't appear in the natural. They were made out of faith. God, as we know, spoke the word of God. He said, light be and light was, and that started the whole universe. So he operated by faith to even call into matter, to reality, what he saw in himself. Now, here's the point. If he was random about it, if he just said, ah, light be, and, and it, there was no plan, then who knows what we'd have. We'd had a mess. But God is not uh, sporadic. He doesn't do things in a haphazard manner. He always has a very detailed plan. So how did the plan fit into this? Well, that's what hope is. Hope is the, as a matter of fact, let, let me give you a little background on the word hope. The word hope that's used here is elpidzo in the Greek. Uh, the, the strong says to expect or to confide, to have a thing to hope or to trust. If you dig a little deeper, Go into uh, Young's Concordance. Go into uh, various analytical uh, Greek definitions. You'll find that elpidzo means, and this is the best definition I've found, it means the confident anticipation or expectation. Actually, I left the word out. Constant favorable anticipation or expectation. See, you could have an unfavorable expectation, and that gets into fear. 
And of course, fear is not faith. Faith is not fear. They're reciprocals. So, constant favorable expectation. Well, let's expand that a little bit more. When we say expectation, what are we talking about? We're talking about the expected or anticipated end result of something ordered, of something that is a plan. So God had a plan. It's called, in this case, hope, anticipation or expectation. And so he knew in his, in his mind, if you will, exactly how he wanted the universe to exist. Then he formulated the best way to say what he wanted to come to pass. And he said, light. <laughs> now what's funny about that is, and I've said this many times, you may have heard me teach along these lines, the word light is just the word light. It's just light. But it's light in the present tense. It's as though he looked out into the nothingness of the nothingness of the nothingness and just said, I see light. Except he phrased it as light, like he was recognizing it. Light. He was calling something into existence that did not yet exist. Light didn't exist. Yet he said light. But when he said it, it came to pass. So his plan was codified into that one word, light. Now, again, as you may have heard me say, I like to think of it this way. The word light encompasses the entire electromagnetic waveform spectrum, which goes all the way from invisible light to ultraviolet light, all the way through the spectrum that we see in, up to infrared, which is heat, and then it keeps going into various types of radiation, gamma radiation, and so forth. The entire spectrum of everything that is made can be expressed by light. And that's what God chose to use to say light and bring it to pass. Now, faith gives substance to the things you expect, anticipate, that you have planned in God's case here. It is the evidence of things not seen. Now, I said faith is the giving of substance. Again, that's from a Greek study. It is the giving of substance. In other words, if I don't, if I, if this mouse, I'll use this mouse as an example. I, I, mice are handy to use as examples. I've noticed that when I teach, just because it's a physical thing. This was the plan of somebody at some point. And they decided they were going to make one with a laser and they were going to create it this way and they were going to put these buttons on it and a little wheel, which I just scroll past the scripture. <laughs> But at any rate, they designed it, and they called it a mouse. Now, you know, it really doesn't look like a mouse, like a cat would chase. Exactly. It, it looked more like a mouse in the back in the days when it had a wire coming out the back, but this is wireless. <laughs> but at the same time, this was designed. This had a plan. Whoever created this brought it together, designed it, and configured it and manufactured it. But at some point, they had to give substance to it. While it was still a plans and an idea, it didn't have any substance. There came a point that substance was given to the plan. Hope, you might say, is the plan. Now, the, the teaching, and I already told Belinda this, the teaching I was going to do was hope, faith's thermostat. And that comes from a good example. Now, we know pastor gets in here and all these lights are beat down on it, he gets really hot, he says, somebody turn that thermostat down, pointing to the back wall. Well, back on that back wall is a little box. And that box is what she turned down. But, uh, you know, it's kind of like the old man that was out in the woods. I mean, he's an old country boy. He didn't have any education. He didn't know anything about anything except being out in the woods, chopping down trees. That's all he knew. And so he decided one day he was going to go into the store had to get a new axe. He goes into the store, and guy walks over and to the thermostat on the wall and turns it down, and all of a sudden, whoa, fans start blowing, and cool air starts coming out. He said, what's that? And the old boy behind the counter said, what's well, the thermostat? He said, what'd you do? I turned it down. And that's cool in this building? Whole store, it was getting cooler. And the guy said, well, yeah. Can I buy one of them things? 
Well, yeah, we got them for sale there, right here in the back. So he goes and gets one in a brand new in a box. And the uh, guy says, thank you, pays for it. You know, gets back on his mule, goes back into the woods, goes back to his log cabin, no electricity, no nothing, just a log cabin. He sticks it up on the wall, drives a nail, and drives it into the wall. And then he turns it down and sits there. Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to get cooler. But it kept getting hotter. And he's like, it's not getting cool. So he, he took the thing, jerked it off the wall, got back on his mule, goes back into town. He said, this thing don't work. I said, well, did you hook it up? Well, I put it up on the wall like yours. Did you hook it up to the furnace and the AC? Uh, what? Well, see, the problem is he had the goal setter, which is what hope is. He didn't have the power behind it, which is what all that equipment, you hear all this, you know, sound of all the air flowing, and you go back in the back, and there's this huge, big air conditioner back there, or there's, maybe there's units up on the, the roof, monstrous things that cost thousands of dollars to get up there. and have to be all connected, and all these vents have to be run, and duct work, and everything else. Then your thermostat will work. So, you know, he just didn't understand. Well, see, this is where a lot of Christians are today. They don't understand that just having the hope doesn't get them healed because there's no power to hope. Now, this is why, way back when I got involved in the Word of Faith, which was the early 70s, uh, it was right in the middle of the teaching revival or the Word of Faith revival, whatever you want to call it. Brother Hagen, and Brother Copeland were just really kind of coming on the scene strong. And so I started listening to them teach, and then I started listening to other teachers, Charles Capps and others through the years. And there was a period of time there where Word of Faith people put down hope. Now, their reasoning was, well, people that just have hope aren't going to get results. They've got to have faith. So I've got to get them into faith. So you guys got to leave hope. Well, see, they missed out. You don't throw away the hope. You got to have the plan, you got to have the anticipation, the expectation before you can give substance to it, before you can create it with the power of God, which is the faith. Now, you got to have the faith and you got to have the hope. Hope by itself won't work. It'll, it'll make you feel so good. Oh, I'm just, I'm believing that I'm going to have whatever, you know, and you, if that's your hope, that's your expectation, and you're just, you're just sitting there happy as you could be. Just like that old guy in the woods. But there's no power behind it. you got to have the power in order to have the result. Now, at the same time, you can have all the power sitting out there, and if that thermostat was broke, you couldn't make it cooler in here. So you got to have both. you got to have the hope. you got to have the faith. Now, I've heard people say, <laughs> in all my years of ministry, well, now, Brother Bill, don't go to the hospital and talk to so-and-so and get their hopes up, right? They say, oh, you see, you just set them up. You know, you're going to make it worse. It's much better just go pat their hand and tell them that, you know, you're thinking of them, praying for them, have a little Mickey Mouse prayer and go home. That's what ministry was before we got revelation of the Word of God and the Word of Faith. And so they tell me, don't get their hopes up. Well, I'm sorry, you've got to get their hopes up. They have to have expectation or anticipation. If they're laying there in the hospital bed and they're sick, maybe even have been told by the doctors they're going to die, and they come to a point they have no hope, they cannot have faith because there's nothing to give substance to. They've got to have hope to give an impetus to put their faith on it. Now, on the other hand, this is another situation I've seen. You go to the hospital. This person's been listening to your radio program. You know, reading Brother Hagin's books, Brother Copeland's books. They are pumped. They got all kinds of hope of their healing, but they have no faith. They haven't built the word into their heart. They just decided as soon as they heard you know, the doctor's report, oh, I better get on faith. So they started reading and studying, trying to get it all built in as quick as they could, and they don't have faith built into them. Ooh, but they got hope. 
Oh, I'm going to be healed. I'm the healed Lord. I'm healed. I'm healed. And their symptoms get worse because they don't have the faith. They've got to have the power behind the expector, the thermostat. Well, how do we do that? Yeah, I heard Brother Fred Price one time. And it was a sobering message. He said, you know, a person that's been diagnosed with a terminal disease, if they suddenly decide, man, I'm going to get in faith, and they study, and they pray, and they pray in the Holy Ghost, and they study the Word, and they listen to tapes, and they do all the right things to get healed, may still die. And I went, what? And he said, the reason is that sickness, that disease has had a chance like a, like a relay runner. Relay runner hands off to the one guy. He hands off to the next guy. Well, if the guy, the first guy, was a slow, you know, poor runner, when he finally hands off to the second guy, they're already behind. The other team is way ahead. And they're giving it their best shot. The next guy that got the baton, man, he is running as hard as he can. Supernatural effort but he's still behind the first team, and they win the race. Well, sickness and disease, unfortunately, in some Christians' lives that have not heard the message of faith, that have not studied the Word of God concerning faith, that have not built it into their heart already, they can do all the right things and still end up losing the race. Now, at the same time, they go to heaven. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, that's the great thing about being a Christian. You win either way. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I'm talking specifically about healing. Specifically about this subject of healing. You've got to have the expectation, the anticipation. You've got to have that to give substance, or to be the, uh, the plan, so to speak, to, for the faith to give substance to. And then you've got to have the faith. Now, I ministered to my dad before he passed away. And he didn't believe like we do. He's Southern Baptist. He didn't know anything about divine healing. He didn't know anything about baptism of the Holy Ghost. He specifically didn't know anything about tongues. I mean, he, you know, he was kind of like, you know, boy, I'd rather you be crazy fanatic on the Word than off here doing something else. So you have at it, but not for me. So one day I was up in his shop. He had a, what he called the shoe shop because he used to be a shoe repairman at Mills Home. And he had gotten all of his stuff from Mills Home. They were going to throw it away, so he got it and put it in his shop. He had a had shoe lass, he had hammers, he had the nails, he had all the, you know, the makings for shoes and so forth there. And he would build stuff and all this kind of thing. And that was, that was his happy place. That's where he liked to go. And so one day he was up there, and you know, yeah, like any other kid, I wanted to be near my dad. So I went up to the shop, and we'd just hang out. We'd just talk, you know. And I'm sitting there one day, he's working on something, just nailing. He was a very quiet guy. You know, he wasn't very boisterous in terms of uh, talking all the time. Now, once you got him talking, you kind of couldn't shut him up. But, you know, he, he wouldn't really start conversations very much. So he's, uh, he's there just working. And all of a sudden, he just kept nailing. He didn't look at me. But all of a sudden, he said, you know, I just don't have the faith you have. I said, what? I mean, this guy, I mean, <laughs> he'd been teaching in Sunday school his whole life. He, at the time, he was teaching the adult class at the Baptist church. And he was teaching on some things that they weren't too sure about. I mean, for one, one thing, he started talking about the devil and demons one day. And one of the guys, you know, businessmen in the local community, they came up, oh, Mr. Bailey, now, you don't really believe there's a devil, do you? He said, here you are at a Southern Baptist church, don't believe in the devil. <laughs> just, just read him the right act. So, I mean, he'd been teaching what he knew for all these years. And I, I saw him teach an excellent message on tithing. He took big old uh, silver dollars, and he'd stack them one after the other while he's teaching. You know, not all at the same time. He'd put one down, and he'd teach a while. He'd put another one down, and he'd teach a while. And then he got a stack nine high, and he put the last one over here to the side. He said, now, folks, you get to keep this stack. God just wants that one. And I went, wow, that's good. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was a good teacher. And I remember all that, and I had great respect for him in terms of his spiritual experience and background. And he, but he, he just didn't turn to look at me or anything. He just says, yeah, I don't have the faith you have. I said, what do you mean? 
He said, I just can't believe to receive healing. And in my heart, in my spirit, I thought, he's right. Because he hadn't heard it taught. He hadn't had the advantage of all the... I had, I had stacks of Brother Copeland's tapes, stacks of Brother Hagin's tapes. I had a tape deck that I wore on my belt like a... You know, like you'd wear a cell phone thing today. But it was a big old tape thing, and I ran a wire up and would stick it in my ear. And while I was at art class in college, I was listening to Brother Copeland teach me the Word. I practically went to Bible school the whole time I was in college. I mean, that's where I was at. I was a wild man. I mean, I had a, had a leather hat with wide brim, and I was a crazy-looking dude. And I'm teaching the Word everywhere I went. And in my spirit, I thought, you know, he's right. He hadn't heard what I've heard. He hasn't meditated on the Word of God. He hadn't got it in his heart. And it, it started bugging me. It really did. It started bugging me. I, Lord, how do I pray for my dad? I know he's born again. Not only, I mean, born again. The man died on the operating table and went to heaven and came back and told the story. They, they revived him. And uh, the Lord told him, you're going to have to go back. And he, he came on back. He said, oh, man, I don't know. The Lord sent me back. But anyway, but, you know, he just told the story, seeing beautiful lights and all this kind of stuff. And he, he loved to tell that story. Told that from the, the platform in Southern Baptist Church. They're all like, what? <laughs> you know? But so he had, he had all, all kinds of experiences. He knew exactly where he was going. But he knew he didn't have long because of his heart problems and so forth. And the doctors had told him, doctors told him that he wouldn't live to see him graduate from high school. Well, he not only lived to see me graduate from high school, he lived to see me graduate from college, and then on beyond that, <laughs> a few years beyond that. So anyway, so I'm, I'm asking the Lord, Lord, what, how, what do I do? How do I minister to him? How do I pray for Dad? And the Lord led me to Scripture concerning praying for mercy. See, the mercy of God goes beyond, if you will, and, and I, don't, I don't want to say this in such a way that gives anybody the wrong impression. There are a lot of people that, that call Word of Faith people legalistic because we are so sticklers for the letter of the Word. And that's true to a certain extent. I am a stickler for the letter of the Word. If it's not in the Bible, I don't want to hear it. Okay, But there is grace and there is mercy. And mercy basically says, you know, it's kind of like the man with it, you know, was talking to Jesus about his son. And Jesus said, do you believe I can do this? And the man said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. In other words, I know I'm not there. So help me. And the Lord went ahead and healed his son. Mercy. The Lord is full of mercy. And he just said, pray for mercy. So I prayed for mercy. And many a time, he would go to the doctor, and the doctor would send him to the hospital, and he was laying in the hospital. I'd come out and just lay my hand on him and say, Father, I just thank you for mercy. He'd come out of the hospital, <laughs> you know, and, and he'd get home. But the, the night that he died, it was funny because he had told me, that same shop, he had told me, you know, that he was in constant pain. Well, you never knew it. He'd never express it. It's very stoic. And uh, he said, I, you know, I, he's getting real honest with me. He said, I'm in constant pain. I don't want to tell mom that, talking about my mother. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think I'm long for this world. He said, so you take care of your mother or I'm going to talk to you about it. And I knew what he meant. I said, okay. So uh, days after that, he goes up to the shop. He's working on his walking sticks and so forth. He comes back down to the house. Uh, he, he liked to watch Johnny Carson. So he'd sit there and watch Johnny Carson. He went to bed. And he just didn't wake up. Now, Dad was funny. Even though he didn't know anything about confession, even though he didn't know anything about faith, even though he wasn't schooled in those things, he just naturally operated in faith. I mean, give you a good example. He went out behind his house and, and, and saw this land that belonged to the neighbor. Well, he didn't covet the land, but he thought it was a nice piece of property, wanted to put some buildings on and so forth. So he just started walking around the land. He'd walk around the land. He'd mark it and walk it. He didn't know why he was doing it. But one day the neighbor came to him and says, Hey, you know, Frank, you, uh, you mow our lawn and you do so much for us. 
I've noticed up there around the property, let me just give you that land. Gave him an acre and a half of land. And to this, you know, to this day, I'm sure he does now, he's in heaven, he understands it, but he didn't know why he was walking around that property. He was claiming it by faith, didn't even know it. <laughs> so he just did things like that. Well, he'd been saying his whole life, as far as I know, I could, as far as I can remember at least, he said, the way I want to go is I want to go to bed and the Lord just hit me in the head and take me home. <laughs> That's my dad, all right, country boy. Lord, just hit, hit me ahead and take me home. I, I just want to not wake up the next morning. It's exactly what he got. It's what he said. That was his confession, and that's the way he wanted to go, and that's the way he went. He had the house paid for, well, long since paid for. He had uh, vinyl siding up on it, had that all paid for, had everything else taken care of, had mom set, told me, <laughs> better take care of your mom, and then he was out of here. So, praise the Lord. Not a bad testimony. He went just like he wanted to go. So, but the thing is, how much better if he had been schooled in the word of faith, if he'd understood what we know, for him to have gotten healed, go and see, have the, see the doctors at the VA and have them say, oh, Frank, your mitral valve's fine, your heart's fine, diabetes is gone, everything's fine. And then go home and be with the Lord. <laughs> you know, praise the Lord. And you say, well, that's kind of crazy. What is he going to die of? Well, when your breath leaves your body, you're, you die. You know? That's like the old, the old uh, covenant folks. They just go to bed, kick their feet up, and they're gone. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. But the thing about it is, healing has to be schooled into you. You have to hear it, like we hear it here. You have to study it. I've told you before, Blend and I listen to Word of Faith Radio's Healing Channel all night long. It's playing in the background. Why, oh, Dr. Bill, you were sick or something? You, you, you worried about? No. I'm just playing it. It just charges the atmosphere with faith. And every so often, I'll kind of be half awake, and I'll hear Brother Copeland talking about healing, or I'll hear Keith Moore talking about healing, and I'll go, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to preach that. <laughs> you know, just, just little things. Little things. I find myself almost speaking whole messages of, of Keith Moore because <laughs> we've heard him over and over and over again. But the thing is, you keep schooling yourself. You keep building it into you. Faith requires hope. Let's go look at one other scripture. Keep in mind all the time here. Hebrews, uh, or excuse me, we are already in Hebrews. Uh, where was I going to go? Romans chapter 4. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 4. And let's start in verse... Well, let's start verse 13. Talking about the promise made to Abraham. God made Abraham a promise he was going to be the father of many nations. So verse 13 says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, that is, Hebrew nation, but through righteousness of faith. For if they which were are of the law be heirs, faith be made void, and the promise of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise, might be sure to all the seed, not only that which is of the law, which is the Hebrew nation, but to that which is of the faith of Abraham. That's us. See, we operate by the faith that Abraham is known for. Who is the father of us all? Makes it plain. As it is written, I have made thee, Abraham, the father of many nations, before whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. How did he operate his faith? He called those things that be not as though they were. Well, that sounds familiar. Kind of sounds like Mark 11, <laughs> where Jesus told him to speak to the mountain. Call those things which be... Now think about that phrase. See, that's good King James. Calleth those things which be not as though they were. That means it doesn't exist yet, but you call it like it was. Light didn't exist yet, but God said light. See, that's the way he operates. And in fact, it says here... Uh, before he who be believing, God who quickly the dead calls those things which be not as though they were, who against hope, there's a word hope, 
believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And not being weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Now think about that. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, were way beyond having a baby in the natural. God had to do a creative miracle on her womb, had to do a creative miracle probably on Abraham, and then have everything work, have, you know, as they say, the plumbing work <laughs> correctly in order to have a child. And then that child had to go on to be the father of many nations. So it was, it was not a short-term miracle. You know, it was a big miracle here at this point and here at this point and here at this point and all, all the way down. It was a big deal. And it was the creation of the entire nation of Israel was through this, this point. But what I want you to see here, verse 17, As it is written, I made thee father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and God calls those things which be not as though they were. God called the universe into existence with words. Abraham, like God, called those things which be not as though they were. Now, I've heard scholars say that here where it says he considered not his own body, it's kind of like he ignored it. According to scholars, they say that he saw his own body, he saw Sarah's body, he knew it was not possible in the natural, but he did not stop there. He believed the promise of God that it was going to happen and then put aside what he knew about the natural. Now I've had to do that myself. I've had to say, well you know, in the natural this doesn't look good. But I'm going to stand in faith, I'm going to believe God and that's, that's my confession and that's where I'm going to stand and I'm not going to let anything slip out of my mouth that is contrary to what I'm believing to come to pass. I have set my expectation, hope, I'm confessing the Word of God that I built into my spirit, and it's going to come to pass. But notice, matter of fact, I didn't plan to do this part, but let's go over to Mark. I mentioned it, Mark 11. Of course, verse 22. Jesus answering, saith unto them, Have faith of God, or some translations say, Have the God kind of faith, or have God's faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatever he saith. Three saith to one believeth, as we've said before. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Notice the word, actually words, them, T-H-E-M in the text. They're in italics. That means they weren't in the original translation, original languages. They were added by the scholars because they thought it would improve the flow. But it has nothing to do with the sentence that's actually there in the Greek. So let's read it without the thems. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive, and you shall have. Believe you receive. That's an active point. Believe that you receive is actually believe you have received it already. I don't, I don't have the light. I don't have the child. But I believe I have received it already. And then it says, and you shall have. Manifestation comes after you have believed that you have received already. So the person laying there in the bed sick, they built the Word of God into their Spirit. They've heard the word, and now they've got their expectation out there. I'm believing for my healing, and they pray, and they pray to, to receive the manifestation. They need to believe they have received their healing before it's manifest. They need to believe they received their healing before they get out of the bed. Brother Hagen, bedfast, couldn't move, paralyzed, laying there, couldn't, couldn't even turn his pages, said it took hours just to turn one page on the Bible because he couldn't move. And he saw this truth. And he said, I believe 
that I received my healing. So I am the healed. I'm the healed of the Lord. I know, I know beyond a shadow of doubt. Remember what it said about Abraham? He was fully persuaded. Fully persuaded. So here's, here's Brother Hagin. Fully persuaded. I'm the healed. And what did the Lord tell him? Well, healed men don't lay in the bed. Get up. Well, now the rubber's going to meet the road. It's okay to lay there. I'm healed. But now you've got to get up. So he starts... I mean, he's got muscles hadn't been used in months and months and months. And he forces himself up, and he gets up, and he walks into the next room, and his grandfather's there and said, What, is the dead raised? <laughs> Practically, yeah. <laughs> he died several times before this. But he got up. It, he was, it wasn't, I think he was like 16 years old at the time. And he, he got stronger. He's skinny as a rail. You see pictures of him back then. He had to gain some girth and, and some strength and build himself back up, but he was healed. But he first had to believe that he had received already, and then he shall have. And that's where we're at. And that's, that is the point. I'm telling you, that is the point that is the hardest thing to get across to people. They know what the Word says. But to get them to actually be fully persuaded and believe that they have received and not, this is the point here, not be concerned that it hasn't manifested yet. You know what I'm saying? Believe, I believe I have received. I'm the healed of the Lord. I am healed. I am the healed of the Lord. And then when the Lord says, get out of bed, oh boy, now I got now I got to act on my faith. Well, isn't that what the Bible says we have to do? Is act on our faith? So, healing, praise the Lord, is a provision that God has provided for us. But we have forces resisting against it. I heard Brother Keith Moore, one of those nights I was laying there kind of half awake, and he was teaching on the radio. And he said, do you realize there are tens of millions of Christians that don't believe in healing? God's provided the provision. It's there. It's available for them, but they don't believe. They do not believe. Are they going to be physically healed? No, because they don't believe. Millions of people. And I know he's right because I came out of a church that didn't believe in healing. Now, if somebody got healed... And it couldn't be explained. They go, mysterious are the ways of the Lord. Nobody knew why. They just kind of slipped into it or whatever. Hey, did you hear Sister Sally got healed? Oh, that's really great. You know, halftime, wonder if it's the devil. <laughs> they just didn't know. And all of those folks, you know, I, I heard Normal Hayes say one time, he said, Lord, don't let my name get on the chalkboard down at the First Baptist Church because they're all praying, Lord, comfort his family as he's dying. I mean, they're, they're praying him into the grave. He said, whatever, Lord, don't let my name appear on that chalkboard. See, that's, that's the background that a lot of people have. It's the background I came out of. But now you couldn't, you couldn't convince me God doesn't heal for anything. I've seen it. You come too late. I've seen miracles. I've seen the power of God in operation. And I know why. I know from the Word of God. And the Bible is full of it. Again, Keith Moore, I'll, I'll try to shut up on this one. Keith Moore was teaching along, and, and he was talking about these preachers that, that didn't believe in healing. And I suddenly, in my mind's eye, this was not some revelation from God, but in my mind's eye, I saw some preacher sitting at his desk trying to prepare his sermon and looking up and saying, Lord, couldn't you have one incident in the Bible somewhere where Jesus laid his hands on somebody and they got sick? But you know what? There's not any in there. It's just not in there. Why? Because everybody he laid hands on got well. Healing is from God. Sickness and disease is from the devil. Hallelujah. Acts 10, 38. So, and, and one other quick scripture. 
I know I just can't shut up sometimes. But I'm a try. Psalm 103. I actually did plan to get to this one today. Psalm 103, 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Notice he tells his mind, will, and emotions to bless the Lord. There are times you're going to have to do that. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. That spirit, soul, and body. All that is within me. Bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. God has benefits for his children. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Don't forget that part. You know, with all the talk of uh, terrorism and all that going on, don't forget the benefit we have that he redeems us from destruction. That's divine protection. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. I like that one too. It's kind of nice to know that God is crowning me with loving kindness and tender mercies. You know, I kind of like God, you know, kind of pat me on the head. You, you doing good, boy? <laughs> you know? Who satisfies thy mouth with good things. Well, that means you've got to be using your mouth, speaking words. Satisfies my mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Glory to God. Just turned 60 on Monday. But my youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. I mean, it, it struck me when I turned 60. You know what? The thought that I had. Oh, my goodness, I'm finally middle-aged. 120. Half of it is 60, so I'm finally middle-aged. What do you know? <laughs> but praise the Lord. He satisfies my mouth with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. So we need to look at these benefits and realize, just like I, when I go to, uh, you know, UNC Healthcare, it's my employer, and I look at my list of benefits, if they don't fulfill one of those benefits, I kind of get bent out of shape. Wait a minute now. You told me I had so many days of vacation and that that was a benefit. Well, let's be just as serious about our benefits from the Lord. He gives us these benefits. We need to read them, study them, meditate on them, confess that, praise the Lord, all my iniquities are forgiven. All my, all, A-double-L, -L, all my sicknesses and diseases are healed. My life is redeemed from any destruction. When I'm driving down the highway from here to UNC where I'm working, you know, that's a long trip. That's an hour and a half. And there's a bunch of nuts driving down that highway. But he redeems my life from destruction. I'm not even going to get any paint scratches. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I don't have to think about that. Who crowns, my, uh, crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. He just is saying good things about me. I like that. You know, that's what blessing is, to say something good about somebody. You know, if I, if I say something good about somebody, I'm blessing them. Well, God's always saying good things about me. Hallelujah. And you too. <laughs> but you need to meditate on it. You need to build it into you. All right, praise the Lord. We'll stop right there. I could just keep going. You know, that's the thing about listening to the Word all the time at night. It builds it into you. It just comes out. It's like sticking a pen in a balloon. <laughs> you know, just explodes. But anyway, praise the Lord. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, PO Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.